It's hardcore history. Attention. I've been podcasting since like the Stone Age, 2005. And way back then, and for a long time afterwards, I kind of considered all the other people who were podcasting as my colleagues. We're not really in the sort of industry where you say, yes, my colleagues, and we publish papers, or whatever the normal idea of, of what you might consider a colleague to be. But it really felt the same, right? You're struggling through the same things, learning the same things, running into each other in places, either in person or digitally. These days, of course, it's a lot harder to call every podcaster your colleague when I think I saw a number recently that it's north of 500,000 podcasts or something. But the person I'm about to talk to is undoubtedly my podcast colleague because, well, heck, he's a history podcaster. So right there, we're in a pretty, pretty small gene pool, and he is one of the great podcasters ever. His The History of Rome podcast is legendary. In my mind, it sort of makes him the audio the modern audio equivalent of Edward Gibbon, where he, he, he goes the, like the length and breadth of the entire Roman experience to the fall of the Western Empire. It's hugely popular in one of those podcasts that should be in some section of the Hall of Fame someday. His other one is an amazingly ambitious project, which he pulls off wonderfully, and judging from the success, uh, everyone seems to like revolutions, where he looks at different revolutions so it'll be very interesting to talk to Mike Duncan today about his new book, The Storm Before the Storm. And if you don't know enough about this, um, his book will educate you wonderfully. His show, of course, is available out there. We did a, the longest series we ever did was on this period of Roman history, the Death Throes of the Republic. So there's lots of stuff out there. But I have a feeling most of you are already going to know a ton of this stuff because Rome is wildly popular, which is one of the first questions I ask my history podcast colleague, the great Mike Duncan. Once upon a time, I wanted to do a podcast on Cleopatra. And I sat down, decided it, ordered a bunch of books, and then tried to figure out where you should start the story of Cleopatra. And every time I would go backwards, I would find a domino connected to another domino and another domino. Long story short, that show I wanted to do Cleopatra about, or the show I wanted to do about Cleopatra, turned into the longest series we've ever done because you have to go all the way back to a, a long way in Roman history for the dynamics to become you know, even remotely clear. And people tend to focus on, you know, if this is the Titanic story, the actual sinking of the ship. But, Mike, your new book, The Storm Before the Storm, is about the iceberg and the striking of the iceberg. You know, tell us a little bit about, you know, this story that most people don't know as well as the actual sinking of the ship. Yeah, the way that I put it, I, so my book is The Storm Before the Storm, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic, and it covers the period from 146 BC around there to about 78 BC, uh, which is the death of Sulla, and it covers the couple of generations before Julius Caesar comes along, before Octavian comes along, before Antony and Cleopatra are around, um, to start looking, as you say it, the things that led up to the collapse of the Roman Republic, rather than just jumping right into it. And, and you say it's, you know, people like to focus on the sinking of the ship. And I say uh, that, that jumping into Caesar is like jumping into a movie uh, at, at the third act, at the beginning of the third act, where you, you know, everything is, you know, loud and crazy, and people are fighting with each other. And obviously, people are really passionately committed to this, that or the other thing, but you don't know how it got to this point. You don't know what what were the what were the problems uh, that led the Republic to be so brittle uh, that it could be blown apart a couple of generations later. And that's what I hope that the book is able to explore. And then when you read it and you have completed with it, uh, then you'll have a much richer understanding of why uh, we why what happens with Caesar happens. Let's talk about why we even care what happens to Caesar. I'm a little amazed at the not just modern but ongoing public interest. And remember, a public that is generally not thought to be all that history knowledgeable or even care that much about it, and yet we can continually publish books and make movies and, and have discussions that, that draw comparisons to this republic from more than 2,000 years ago. What do you think 
accounts for the enduring interest on the part of even lay people to this place where, if you think about it, no one should even be, this shouldn't be in the front of anyone's mind 1,500, 2,000 years ago. It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> I mean, like for, for people like us, um, you know, it's just, it's so inherently interesting that it's almost weird to step back and say, like, why would anybody be interested in Rome? Um, because Rome is, at least to me, so inherently interesting. Um, I think what it gets to is that people have a, people know that Rome was this ancient, powerful civilization, and, and it almost is the epitome of what uh, imperial power is, what civilizational power is. We know that it lasted for a thousand years or more, if you include the Byzantines. So I think it's, I think Rome just is always going to have a place in the collective imagination as you go, okay, well, what, if you're at all interested in history at all, let's go to sort of the big and important parts of history. And um, you're always going to then wind up in Rome. And specifically, where people are going to wind up is that is that era between, let's say, the arrival of Julius Caesar and like the death of Nero, right? The death of the Julio Claudian dynasty. That particular era of Roman history, in part because it's so well documented and we know so much about it, uh, is always going to be the place where people go uh, to if they become interested in Rome. That's where they're going to wind up. And it's a lot the same way that I think that no matter what, like the Napoleonic age is going to be permanently something that people keep going back to and back to even 2000 years later when you're like, wow, this is just like some obscure, you know, kind of temporary French empire. There, there, is, there is something about the force of the personalities and the force of the just the political power that is being expressed that's always going to draw people's attention. You know, I, I see that with Napoleon, just like I see that with a Hitler or or even a Genghis Khan. But but to me, the difference is the length of time. You know, it's it, it, instead of one supreme figure that that is um, searing across the pages of the history book, and they're in, innately interesting. You have numerous figures. I mean, just going through your book, it's one fascinating individual. That seems to be almost, I mean, I mean, when you think about what the quota of great men should be in any given civilization during any given time, the period discussed in your book seems to be an era where humanity in that place in that time is exceeding its normal quota of fascinating, august human beings. I would say so. And it's always been a bit surprising to me, uh, you know, having gone through the history of Rome and, you know, gone, gone through the entire history of Rome in pretty minute detail, um, that that particular period between the Gracchi and then Marius and Sulla was always um, w was always a period that I wanted to come back to. Like I, I, I kind of had put a pin in it very early on and was like, you know, this is this is an era that's going to be a lot It's going to be worth coming back to. And to have nobody really have written the book that I wrote, which is let's just focus on this 50 or 60 year period all on its own. I, I won't make this the first couple of chapters in a larger book about the fall of the Republic. I won't make it one chapter in a larger history about, you know, just Roman civilization, but to really like hone in on this particular period. You know, I would, I, I'd always kind of, I would watch the book lists with one eye. Like, is somebody going to finally discover that this is a great untapped, like wealth of material? Um, and nobody, nobody quite put it together. So I was able to step in and, and now I, I hope deliver a book that will explain why it, I think when people end the book, they're going to be like, why hasn't this been covered in more detail? I think that'll be one of the big questions coming out of it for people. Yeah, I love your subtitle, The Beginning of the End of the Roman Republic. It sounds Churchillian, but you maybe you could have called it also, um, you know, the era when things broke, because that, yeah, wait, wait. <laughs> that really is kind of what it was. You know, and you can see, like you were talking about in the book, they the Romans didn't have this written constitution. They had sort of a set of conduct rules that were just I innately understood by everyone and customs. And when they broke that, it's like, OK, there's no written constitution. So once someone violates the way we do things, right, the way of the elders, uh, all bets are off. Right. It seemed that way um, where there, there was the, there was this thing like but when Rome triumphs and, and what happens in 146 B.C. for people that aren't like caught up with this is that Rome conquers 
Carthage for the last time, their great rival. I mean, Hannibal during the Second Punic War, that's that's about 50 years or so in the past. Um, but their, their great rivalry with Carthage is now over and Rome has emerged victorious. They also decide to just outright conquer and annex Greece into the Roman state. So at this point in 146 BC, uh, Rome is without question the strongest power in the Mediterranean world and nobody is going to be able to challenge them. There is something, uh, uh, this triumph actually opens up a whole host of new problems for the Republic and for the leadership of the Republic that they just sort of start to fail to address and fail to deal with. And it creates a, a powerfully new, like confrontational style of domestic politics that had never really existed before. Uh, the Roman Senate and the Roman elites had always been pretty clubby with each other. They had always been like, oh, there are some, you know, we'll ultimately make compromises with each other. Or, you know, if we don't all agree on something, we'll just we'll just put it to bed. And what happens after 146 is you start having these leaders start to break away and start to tap into new energies that are floating around out there. And with this new confrontational style of Roman politics, yeah, people start abandoning those old unwritten norms and unspoken uh, modes of behavior. And once you start down that road, I mean, it, you, tell you, you can pro you can pull out of it. What, what happened to the Romans is that they were not able to pull out of it. And if you start going down this road, you ultimately discover that even written laws, even following written laws, is merely a custom. It's merely a norm. Um, there's no There's nothing about a piece of paper with laws written on it that compels me to do anything to follow that law. I'm just simply, I'm giving it power with my own because that's how we do things. But if somebody say has a, you know, a, an army or a gun or a baseball bat, you know, that actually is the ultimate definer of power. It's just brute force. So once you start giving up on sort of what you would call, oh, minor unspoken rules, you eventually will get to the point where everybody has to admit that only brute force is really what's at play. You know, I love that line, whether it was really said or not, that, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it sometimes rhymes. And I look at the Roman Republic, I think like everyone does. And, you know, it's hard not to see um, patterns and, and similar dynamics. And I, I think if for no other reason than because it's another commercial republic that's large and imperial. And right there, you're going to have some things that look similar. And we all understand that if you look a little beneath the surface, there's a ton of things that are different. I mean, slavery, outright slavery, for example. But you point out in your book, and I thought it was interesting, you were you were drawing comparisons to if the U.S. and the Roman Republic are following a similar charted course, for lack of a better word, where would we be now in terms of where the Romans were? Can you talk a little about that? Because I thought that was, I mean, if you look at the Punic Wars as like the World Wars and whatnot, I think it's a fascinating way to come up to a conclusion saying, okay, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, we haven't done this yet. So where do you put us in the book compared to um, Roman history in a similar place? Right. So all all caveats aside that this all is caveats like, this aside, is, this, this is this is not actually the way that history works. We're not like in some repeating. That's loop right. We're speculating we're wildly and irresponsibly. We're different Absolutely. Clothes, right. Um, so that's what I do, Mike. Welcome to my show. <laughs> um, OK, so let's say that the Roman Empire is out there and there's like a thousand years worth of history and, and we're sitting here in the United States or in the West generally at the beginning of the 21st century. And you want to say like, well, what what is there that we can look to in Roman history? Is is there a period in time that we can look to that is more analogous to our own situation than another? And it, it's really it's a lot by process of elimination uh, where, you know, are we a brand new little city state that has just recently been colonized or founded by, you know, a group of uh, dissidents and vagabonds and escaped slaves? Like, no, that. That happened 400 years ago in our own history. That would be, you know, the early days of uh, the colonization of North America. Uh, are we at a stage where a group of disgruntled aristocrats overthrows a king and establishes a, a new kingless republic uh, that is more or less a, an elite-led oligarchy? Like, no. That would be, if anything, that's that's you know that's the founding fathers. That's the American Revolution. Um, then what Rome does is, is it emerges as, as a new republic, and over the next couple of hundred years, it starts to expand slowly across Italy in a series of, in a series of wars that are collectively dubbed the Samnite Wars that wind up with Rome being the most dominant power in the Italian peninsula, on the Italian peninsula. 
so is the United States a recently emerged regional power? Um, I Again, I don't think that anybody would describe the United States as a recently emerged regional power. And all of that probably corresponds to, you know, our slow and steady conquest of North America and everything that we did to the American Indians uh, battling with Mexico and taking uh, their the entire north half of their country. And then you even get later on and you say... Well, after that, Rome goes to war with Carthage, goes to war with Greece, goes to war in Spain, and they emerge as this dominant, what you might call a global power, at least in the context of the Mediterranean. And again, the United States isn't even there because we did all of that. Uh, we are one of the acknowledged great powers, and especially after the Cold War. I mean, in the 1990s, you know, we're describing the United States as a hyperpower almost. Now, I think that's been tempered quite a bit in the last few years, but certainly we're not finding our footing for the first time as a global power. We've been dealing with those issues, um, you know, since the end of World War II and all through the Cold War. So then you push forward a little bit more and you say, okay, well, has the Republic, you know, have we collapsed into a, you know, a generations long civil war uh, where a warlord has, uh, in effect, emerged victorious from and set himself up as a dictator? No, that hasn't happened yet. So if we haven't gotten to that point yet, if the Republic has not yet collapsed, and I certainly don't believe that the Republic has collapsed, um, then you say, okay, well, maybe the United States is kind of now roughly in this same setting where after Rome had emerged as a global power, but before the Republic collapsed, let's, let's take a look at this era. It's the beginning of the end of the Republic, which is right after this period, 146 BC, which as we said earlier in the show or earlier in this interview was, is already a period that is like inherently fascinating in its own right. And as it turns out, I think that they were dealing with a number of issues that you could say the United States is dealing with right now. And so it's worth going through what the Romans went through and how they responded to it. And maybe it could, uh, maybe it could influence how we decide to deal with our own problems today. I was playing a silly game while I was re you know, reading your book is to remind me of a bunch of things that I haven't, I haven't looked at in a while and, and the battles over public land and the distribution of land to veterans and all that stuff and the problem that the Romans were having keeping armies in the field when they were essentially, you know, conscripts is not really the right word, but farmer armies that had to go home and tend to their home were now on long service a thousand miles away from home and the farms going to heck. And, and how long can you maintain? And I thought... You know, if we tried to run our current foreign policy in the United States with a military that was operating with the draft situation that we had, say, in the 1950s, I don't know if we could do it. How much does the dynamic of having, um, you know, a bunch of veterans coming home from these wars and having you know, real gripes about the, the situation that they find themselves in, the fact that they might have to go back in service, the fact that their homes are falling apart while they're gone. Talk to talk a little about that dynamic. It reminds me a little like the Fry Corps in Germany or the, the bonus marchers in our own history. I mean, a bunch of long service military veterans angry with nothing to do <laughs> sounds like a recipe for um, political change, we'll just say. Yeah, I would I would say so. And what what is happening is it's one of these situations where again the the Romans are had been more or less running what you might call a glorified militia where you were you were you would enter into the service, you would actually if 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 harvest time came and everybody was still fighting each other like both sides would quit the field uh, and everybody would go home and harvest their fields and these imperial wars of expansion that Rome got caught in uh, yes, yeah, starts to take the poor, the lower class citizens away from their farms, away from their families for longer and longer periods of time. And so this period of triumph is for the for the Roman state, for the Republic itself as an entity, the, the Senate and the people of Rome, um, turns out to be fairly economically disastrous for a lot of these lower class uh, Roman citizens, they're they're going to start to lose their farms. They're going to start to get bought out by wealthy neighbors because you take you know you'd rather take some money uh, and get out while you can than watch it all go to ruin. So yeah, it really does. And the, and the bonus the bonus marchers are a good example of this, um, which happened uh, right before you know right right in the midst of the Great Depression here in the United States, is that. They they had these grievances. They had these legitimate grievances. Their families had had these farms for, you know, in perpetuity, you know, going back into the misty eras of the early republic or even the kingdom days. 
And they've, they're now starting to lose all of that. And their traditional ways of life are being upset. And they are feeling that the Senate and the government of Rome is, a, they, they are consolidating all of this massive imperial wealth, but none of it seems to be trickling down to the poorer farmers, to the poorer citizens. So you have, uh, you have a situation where these new leaders, as I was saying, you can, you can start to break out and say, hey, I as a as a noble leader, you can say, hey, I think that there's an opportunity for me here to uh, get enormous political influence and political power and political popularity by promising these people who have all of these grievances, I'm gonna I'm gonna solve your problems. We're gonna go to the rich. We're gonna take their land by basically by force. We're gonna chop it up and we're gonna redistribute it to all of you. This is an incredibly popular thing that can be done, and this opens uh, the new like populare style of Roman politics, which is instead of this elite noble consensus being the driver of your policies, it's directly appealing to the rural peasants and the urban plebs who are feeling negative effects from Rome's imperial triumph rather than a bunch of positive effects. Well, and it brings up the age-old question. I'd like to get your opinion on it as a guy who's talked about Rome as much or more than anyone I can think of. The idea that that these people who appealed um, to the popular crowd, um, were they really, was that was that a real position or was that you know, they just had latched on to a political uh, uh, win. They put their finger in the wind, find out, oh, this cause of giving land to the veterans is popular, so I'll do that. It seems to me that that if I look at it as a, as a novice, some of these reformers look more real than others. Um, do you have a feeling, I mean, like uh, uh, Caius and, and Tiberius Gracchi, I mean, uh, to me, those seem... People always like to compare them to the Kennedy brothers. That That's ridiculous. But at the same time, you have two brothers, both assassinated, uh, both that a lot of people were able to romantically put a lot of hopes in and, and lionize afterwards. I mean, do you look at those guys as um, as sincere reformers or are they all charlatans working a political angle? Um, well, or are none of them? <laughs> no, I no, I, I have an answer to this because now I've now I've gone through it. And this is, as you point out, this is one of like the great debates. Um in Roman history generally, and also just like world history in general, is, you know, are these various popular reformers, are they merely cynical demagogues, or are they genuinely interested in reforming the state? Um, and certainly, even while the Gracchi were still alive, their, their, um, their allies were saying, oh, they're, you know, they're driven by lofty ideals and, uh, and a genuine regard for the people and their enemies are producing pamphlets that say, oh no, they're, they're trying to make themselves the new Kings of Rome. So where I, I do come down on it about the Gracchi in particular, that I think that they were interested in genuine reform. There was no like altruism at work here. I mean, we're talking about like high Roman politics. There's not a lot of altruism going around out there. But I think that they saw simultaneously that a path to personal power, which is what they were after, they were incredibly ambitious, uh, could simultaneously solve a lot of the problems that Rome was now dealing with as it transitioned from being merely an Italian city-state, one, one among many, to like the rulers of the entire Mediterranean world. Um, but they existed on a spectrum where this same, you know, the same milieu of populare energy uh, coming out of the rural peasants or the urban plebs, uh, even in the lower equestrian classes that have a lot of wealth but don't have a lot of um, input politically, uh, those can be harnessed by people like the Gracchi, and they can also be harnessed by cynical demagogues who, yes, are just there to say, hey, you're angry, I know that you're angry, I'm going to help you channel that anger, and I'm going to tell you who's to blame for all of your problems. And then I'm going to point you at the people who I'm telling you are to blame for it. And, uh, oh, wouldn't you know it, the people who are to blame for it are my personal enemies. So you can use that same sort of – it becomes a, it becomes quite a, a revolutionary energy. Um, you can start to use that and manipulate it. So I think it, it's never fair to say that all of them are sincere reformers and or all of them are cynical demagogues. It's – it's quite a mix of the two and people are going to land on a spectrum and people say, you know, people bring up the, the Kennedy brothers for the Gracchi, which doesn't really hold a lot of water. Um, but if there is anybody in American history who does look like the Gracchi, I think it's the Roosevelt's um, where what Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt and that 
the, the progressive reforms that they were making, both of them were incredibly ambitious. Both of them wanted to be president. Both of them kind of wanted to be president forever. Um, and they were called traitors to their class. Yeah, and they were, of course, they were absolutely. And so they're very similar to the Gracchi in that way, that they were, you know, inner, inner, inner circle nobility. And uh, they're using all of their power and wealth and influence to really disrupt what the elites have going for them. So I think if anybody is out there uh, in American history that does look like the Gracchi, it's probably the Roosevelt's. Well, I'm enjoying the analogy comparison too much to stop now. So maybe you can give me, have you ever thought about some of these other figures in your book and thought about, um, American examples. I mean, I can look at like a Huey Long, for example, and see someone that maybe would have fit back into the Roman things. I remember, you know, was it Manchester's book on MacArthur and American Caesar? I mean, there's always comparisons. Um, you know, when you look at the Sullas and the Mariuses and Cato the Elder and all those folks, do you have any analogies that you often think of when you think of some of these major figures? Well, not to, uh, you know, not to, you know, uh, rain on anybody's parade, but once you get once you get onto that like granular level, like like who is you know who would Drusus be? Um, it does start to get harder to pin people down. Uh, like was MacArthur was MacArthur an American Caesar? I uh, I don't know, but it seems like probably a good thing that Truman fired him. <laughs> you know, like um, I think it's an insult to Caesar myself, but I'm biased. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say so. I mean, like, yeah, of, of all the people that I've ever gone through that you can compare to Julius Caesar, I mean, like it's Napoleon. That's right. Nobody exactly. Else, yeah. Nobody else really like measures up to that particular class of, you know, having the totality of like, I'm, I can be genocidal and also like reform the metric system. And I'm a genius. Yes. So have I successfully dodged the question? Yes, I think so. I think so. Well done. Um, so, so okay, so then let's talk then a little bit about um, the dynamics here because, you know, it's funny because when you look at the Roman system, it, it, it seems to be the wonderful, unless you want to go to the Greeks, but it's the wonderful example um, of, of the class divisions and then the problems inherent with, with class warfare and sharing of power I mean, if you wanted to describe, I mean, we're talking about the iceberg that sinks the Titanic here, and we can talk about rules shifting and warlords and everything. But but what was it in that, that shifted in terms of a public being willing to accept senatorial control by, a, a, as you pointed out in the book, a really small number of people in a fundamental sense and, and, and be able to push, I mean, the, the, the tribune of the plebs was one systemic tool that was introduced to help balance out those powers. Um, could you say that that whole era between um, Tiberius Gracchus and maybe Caesar is an example of class warfare sort of playing out? I mean, how, how much of a role would you give to that? Ambitious men versus class warfare uh, versus yeah, cycles it's, and trends. It's, it's, re it's really difficult to to get into because Roman politics d did operate differently than modern Western politics. Like the does, client system, where, for example. Yeah, like, yeah so the, the, the first and most important thing is to say that these are these are more like clan rivalries than um, than class warfare. Where you know you're a pa you're a patron, you're a leader, and you have this network of clients who are all attached to you, and then your political rivals have that same network of um, of clients who are all attached to them. So this is really like th this is really clans running into each other with with almost like nobles and retainers, if you wanted to use like a medieval analogy, rather than rather than like oh we you know we're the lower classes and we are trying to overthrow you guys the the upper classes. But that said, um, during this era, right, after, after 146, I think you do have a new class style of politics that one of these rival clans can take advantage of, right? And so hopefully I'm, I'm able to paint this correctly. So what it is is you have this ability to go out into just the voting public, right? Because all of these people could vote. Um, the rural peasants, the urban plebs, they could all vote. And you could use the popular assemblies to pass legislation to make yourself and your own clan very, very popular. So this is almost something that like, you would be sitting around with your senatorial family, you're, you're an ambitious senatorial family, and you're like, how are we going to get power? Um, that appeal to the populace is an available method of doing it. So 
you're ginning up class interests and you're pointing them at often to, usually you're pointing it at the corrupt Senate and saying like, we're going to, you know, we are going to deliver to you what the corrupt Senate has been denying you. Um, but five years later or 10 years later, maybe your rival has decided to, to try to adopt one of these populare platforms and use that. Well, now you suddenly become the defender of old senatorial interests, um, because your rival is the one who's now doing the popular program. And so, it was a, it was a lot of like taking on and putting off of hats where you were temp you might temporarily be the leader of a populare movement and then 10 years later you might be standing in lockstep with the senate so it was very it was it was a lot more fluid i think than um than anything that would be going on say like you know with with battles between unions battles between like socialists and capitalists in the modern era where there's really class interests involved and you really had also like lower class leaders doing the leading in that sense which you don't really get that in roman history no and it was interesting cuz uh you had included in the book something i think it was cato the elder had talked about uh, and we're getting back here to to the changes in rome because of the punic wars and the various conquests about the amount of wealth that was being dragged back to Rome by some of these people, you know, because most of the people don't benefit from these conquests, but some of these commanders and whatnot would come back. You were talking about 40,000 pounds of silver and things like that. Talk a little about how, and this is this is such a Roman moralizer point of view, right, about how the nouveau riche Romans are forgetting their values, but you included it in the book. How much did the did, did the Roman system change because all of a sudden it went from a well, at least the the portrayals of it make it sound like more Spartan, more old values to you know Cato the Elder looking at the nice figs and saying Carthage must be destroyed. I I think that the role of this new wealth there, there's a couple of things that all of this new wealth does um, does bring into play, right? Like the the Cato the Elder style critique which is that all of this wealth degraded the morality of the upper class or degraded the morality of the Romans, I think is less important. I, I don't think that that is, is a huge driver of, of, of what the problem was. I don't think it was that the wealth degraded their morals. I think it was that it created a skyrocketing economic inequality. Right where there had always been rich and poor in Rome, right? That that is going to be true going all the way back. What was happening is that, as as you just mentioned, and I I read about this in the book, that you have these legions going out. They're going out to Greece and Macedonia. They're going to North Africa, and they're bringing back three hundred thousand gold coins. They're bringing back eighty thousand pounds of raw silver. I mean, literally, like the the specie of the available specie of the Mediterranean is being thrown into Roman wagons and hauled back to Rome, all of which is being controlled mostly by that upper class senatorial elite or the, you know, the, the richer equestrian classes, right? The, the sort of the sub Senate, the, the people who are one step below the senators, these guys are the ones who can are controlling all of this wealth. And I do think that far from degrading the morality of the thing, it does degrade the socioeconomic system, where what are they going to do with all this gold? Uh, the Romans did not, they did not sit around counting, uh, counting their gold pieces like Scrooge uh, in, you know, in, in a Christmas carol. They want to invest their gold into things, and most especially they want to invest it in land. So their, their ability to now command this huge, huge amount of wealth, they're pouring it into trying to buy up as much land as they possibly can. And this does lead to the further dispossession of all of those poorer Roman farmers uh, that we talked about a couple of minutes ago. So that there's that process that is an unfolding, that wealth being controlled by a few rich families is leading those rich families to expand their own land holdings across Italy. And that's just going to disrupt the entire socioeconomic a system at, that had been in existence for hundreds of years. And that's just the one thing that they're investing all of their money in. And the other thing that they're investing all of their money in is slaves. So they're now able, to, the richer Romans are now able to bring slaves into the system on, again, an unprecedented scale. Uh, the Romans had always had slaves, the slaves had always been around. Um, but now you really have the slaves beginning to do most of the at least commercial labor of this of Roman society. They're out there. They're 
picking the, they're doing work in the grape fields. They're, you know, they're doing the olives. They are, if they're skilled, right? If you, if you get captured and you're like, Hey, I can, you know, make tables, uh, then you're going to be put to work making tables for your owner. Or if you're really unlucky, you're going to be sent off to work in one of the mines. And that's, again, that's just going to be producing more and more wealth for the senatorial aristocracy. So that combination of, of massive amounts of wealth, massive amounts of slaves, but always really to the benefit of a very small elite inside of Rome creates, I think, the, the, the fundamentally destabilizing energy that is going to allow some of these, be they genuine reformers, all the way to cynical demagogues or all the way, you know, ultimately culminating with Julius Caesar, who is the populare, you know, uh, reformer slash super ambitious noble par excellence. It's all going to culminate with him. And the slaves, to me, is the ultimate different variable when they do the comparisons between, say, the U.S. now and the Roman Republic. Because even if you wanted to argue about, you know, slave labor being equivalent to low-income labor from over the border or whatever, I don't I don't see the similarity. Uh, and I, it would be... If you wanted to make an analogy with what the Romans did or what a lot of peoples did in, in earlier history, it would be like we went into the Middle East, toppled Saddam Hussein and brought thousands of Iraqis back to the United States to serve us. Um, sounds like an inherently unstable situation to begin with. I found it interesting when you were talking about um, who had power in Rome and you talked about assemblies and that the average Joe on the street had more but I would say both more and less power maybe than one thought. But your line about being able to control Maybe you would, uh, I think in England they called it king mob at one point. The, the ability to control uh, the political heart of Rome as, as the population uh, gave a certain amount of power uh, in the city. It, it always amazed me that, that in that kind of a situation that you never had a French Revolution kind of thing. When, when it's so much a, a large percentage of the population being balanced out by such a small class, but it's that client relationship that sort of weaves the threads of connections, isn't it, through the rich, the poor, and the middle classes. And could you talk a minute about the equestrian class, maybe, and a connection to what today we would call you know, corporations and, and, and the fact that because the Roman senators were not supposed to involve themselves in business, it sort of left a loophole for these other people to come in and create what I think today we would call corporations. You think that's a fair term? Yeah, I think that they were corporations. Uh, they were they were stock. You you would actually buy stock in these things. In, OK, uh, so that's a, fair. In, All right. In, yeah. In, in, a, in a rudimentary way that. Yeah. So there was there was this prohibition on the senators, like somebody who was in the Senate, and you're talking about, you know, maybe 300, 350 men and their families are, are prohibited from conducting commercial transactions. And of course, just the caveat to this is that all of them did it. They, they all had, uh, they all had fronts, they all had clients that they would use were like, oh, this is my guy, you know, uh, Publius, uh, he just he's somebody who just so happens to own a, a large amount of commercial real estate and I just happen to know him and it's like it, it was all a front um, so th most senators were able to dodge this quite easily but the Roman state itself didn't perform any of their own logistical enterprises right like even right down to right right down to tax collection right the the Romans did not have like state employees who were tax collectors they didn't have state employees who made uniforms for the legions and shipped them off to the legions. Um, this was all done by groups of wealthy individuals who were not in the Senate uh, because, because you, you want to be able to get around that, you know, the commercial, uh, the commercial prohibitions. So you have these very wealthy uh, families in Rome who are not a part of the Senate who are actually the ones who are now handling the wealth of the society, the the, the large scale transactions. They're, they're, what they would do is they would come together, say that the tax collectors, if you, if you want one of these tax farming contracts, and you would say, okay, here's how much we're going to bid to get this contract. And then the, the censor once every five years would award, would award a contract. And let's say your company won the bid, then you would now have the right to go to some province or go to some area and be in charge of the tax collection where any amount of money that you that you made out collecting taxes above what you had bid was going to be your profit. Um, that model of extracting taxes from provincials left itself open to like wild corruption and abuse, where if, if your profit margin is simply however much you can get out of these people, 
um, it, it, it's going to lead you to strong arm people. It's going to lead you to demand more than they actually owed in taxes. And the Roman government, the, the Roman provincial administrations, I mean, the people who would actually be out there in nearer Spain or in further Spain, actually representing the Roman government as, as like a state agent. I mean, you're talking about less than a hundred people. You're talking about, you know, it's the governor, his family, and maybe a couple other elected officials. Meanwhile, the face of Rome out there, the people who are actually running the province is is these uh, are these tax farmers with l very little oversight. And you could kind of, like if you were a tax farmer, you could go to a family and say like, "Hey, you owe me this in taxes." The provincial pays the tax. Uh, then you come back around six months later and say, "Hey, you owe me this tax again." And the family could say, "Hey, we already paid that tax six months ago." And the tax farmer would just say, "Well, I don't care. You pay me." Uh, and there's no there's no oversight to any of this, uh, no real effective oversight anyway. And this creates the same kind of um, really anger and resentment at a lot at what the Roman administrators were up to uh, amongst the provincials out out there in Spain or in Greece or later uh, in Asia or what is today Western Turkey. Um, that in and of itself led to a destabilization of their imperial hold on things. And that doesn't all get straightened out really until Augustus comes along and starts introducing uh, more stable reforms. So fleeced by the contractors, right? Um, Very much so. Very much so. So let me let me ask you, and this is there's a little bit of storytelling here because I think it's horrifying. To me, the first time I ever read anything in ancient history that reminded me of like George Orwell's 1984. Uh, and may maybe this is just the way my my brain connects things. But when you read about, you know, the the Marius and the Sulla eras when when prescription lists are going up and people will read about whether or not they're being sentenced to die. I mean, that has such a um, Third Reich kind of Orwellian maybe feel to it. Can you go into that a little bit and talk about um, talk about how different that was for Rome to wake up and, and go see if you you were on the list to die. So at the beginning of the book, right, we're at the, there's conflicts between various political rivals, various uh, political groups, various families, um, and they start maneuvering around each other and they start breaking down these like rules of most maiorum. But it, but kind of in the early days, it's all very ad hoc. It's all very spontaneous. Uh, and it's really more about like maneuvering in new ways that hadn't been done before. You start plodding along through the book. Yeah, you get to chapter eight, you get to chapter nine. Now we're talking about these groups having uh, armed like uh, on retainer armed gangs uh, who are going to fight for you. And by the very end of the book, it becomes necessary to not just defeat your rivals and have them say like, oh, okay, well, I lost that vote or I lost that consulship. I guess I'll go home now. Um, you're, you're operating in a civil war environment where it's no longer enough to just beat your rivals. You have to kill. You have to kill them. And if you don't kill them, then they're going to come back and they're going to kill you. So there's, there's, a, there's a little tight cycle of this where – you know, when I don't want to do too much in the way of spoilers if you haven't read the book. But yeah, I mean, we, we kind of all know it all ends badly for the Romans. So it's not too much of a spoiler to say it ends badly for most of these people. Um, but Sulla goes off to the east uh, to fight his battle, to fight his war against Mithridates. He's had this very intense struggle with Marius and Marius's allies. And Marius and his allies wind up coming into Rome and recapturing Rome, having been booted out a couple of weeks earlier, and they start killing the allies of Sulla. This leads, when Sulla comes back a couple of years later, for Sulla to reciprocate, to, to give as good as he gets, and start, yeah, literally putting up named lists, right? Here's a list of names, and if you kill one of these people and bring me their head, then I will pay you, I will pay you money. And what is kind of, and it also, not just Orwellian, but also like very Kafka-esque, right? Where it's all, it all becomes very arbitrary, um, where the whole, the whole original point of the prescription list was so that the people who Sulla was not planning on killing could rest easy. Like, oh, okay, well, my name's not on the list, so, so I'll be fine. But every day, a new list goes up with new names on it. And you start having names being added to the list, not because they are enemies of Sulla, but because they happen to be enemies of maybe one of Sulla's allies, or in the case of Crassus and uh, 
he is like, hey, you own a very rich estate down here in Campania. I think I would actually like to own that estate. So I think I'm going to declare you an, an, an enemy of Sulla and have you killed. So those prescriptions that sort of eat up the last uh, the last few chapters of the book um, are all very bloody, and they become, you know, it takes on an absurd level where it doesn't even matter anymore whether you're an enemy of somebody. And there, there's a quote from some uh, from some rich equestrian who gets killed, and he's he's like, ah, done for because of my Alban farm. And then yeah, he gets he gets killed, and his farm gets confiscated. So. It it moves very quickly from I have to kill my enemies in order to triumph to just like let's just kill everybody and confiscate their stuff. And it's a wanted dead or alive kind of approach to getting the enemies, isn't it? Sort of like uh, uh, bring us back the head and we'll pay. I mean, uh, a little bit different than sending out your own Gestapo. Exactly. And so you actually started having it, it became a fairly lucrative pr- uh, profession for, for a couple months and even then for a couple years where you would go out and you would be like, hey, well, let's we'll, let, we'll almost like bounty hunters. Right. We'll go. I was just going to say that. Out. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we'll kill them and, and then we'll get their stuff. And what is, you know, and I also do mention this in the book is there does come a point where. They, they start to realize, I mean, they don't realize the way that we do, that there's there are no photographs of anybody. There are no pictures of anybody. Uh, we, they don't live in a digital age where you have a, where Sulla can hold up a picture and then hold up the head and be like, oh, yeah, you got the right guy. And you start having them just grab random dudes off the street, kill them, chop their head off, take it in and say, oh, this is, uh, and then they're like kind of scanning the list. Oh, this is this guy. It's Gaius. Yeah, Papirius. Yeah, he's, yeah, definitely. This is his head. And then you would get your bounty. Yeah, it's a little like uh, this, this black scalp that I'm giving you with black hair. This is an Apache scalp. I guarantee it. You know, yeah. <laughs> Give me my exactly. 250 gold yeah, coins. Yeah, it's all it's all very twisted. It's all it's all very it's all quite sadistic, to be honest. Something that comes to my mind, and I honestly don't know the answer in the period we're talking about here, but but discussing the the attempts by what we would call today foreign powers or foreign entities to influence the politics of a vibrant, let's call it, on the way to corrupt republic. Uh, I just finished a show we did on Caesar's conquest of Gaul, and it's interesting how the more, um, shall we call them civilized or more Romanesque Gallic tribes were basically trying to influence the politics in Rome. During the period you're talking about, are there outside forces from other states trying to um, push their agenda or point of view or the direction they'd like to see Rome uh, move towards? Um, were, were any of the outside entities um, in, in the geopolitical world of the Mediterranean at that time trying to influence Roman politics? Definitely. And this had been true for quite some time where, you know, going back even before the beginning of the book, um, after Rome defeats Hannibal in the Second Punic War, there was a there was a good like 50 or 60 year period where Rome was the most powerful state in the Mediterranean, but not quite hadn't quite decided they wanted to annex and rule the Mediterranean directly, where they almost set themselves up as kind of an arbitrator of last resort uh, for various city states and kingdoms out there. So you would have like a couple of Greek cities who were in having some border dispute or having some like fishing rights dispute, and they would agree to take their case to Rome. And any time these so so Rome became like a hub of international embassies and ambassadors and people constantly envoys coming and going from from really as far away as Syria and Egypt and all of them are bringing with them gifts uh that you know could only be described as bribes where you are definitely going to try to get what you want from the senate by making sure that the right senators have received the right gifts and that that's something that had really this was again something that had opened up and and does get to a, a more corrupt version of the Senate than had existed before. In the context of of my book, the great example of this in my book is Jugurtha's conduct in Numidia, where he is, you know, one of the kings of Numidia after uh, after his I guess adopted father dies along with his two brothers. But Jugurtha would prefer to be the sole king of Numidia. And so he starts breaking treaties. He starts killing his brothers. And he wants the Senate to just go along with what he's doing down there rather than sending in legions or trying to stop him. So he absolutely, quite brazenly and quite nakedly, is sending envoys to the Roman Senate laden with gold and laden with gifts and uh, trying to influence the Senate's conduct. And he's quite successful at it uh, for most of... uh, the first seven or eight years of, of Jugurtha's reign, 
he's definitely able to have more or less paid friends in the Senate direct the Senate away from the notion of ever sending the legions in to confront Jugurtha. And, and it, it gets quite bad where you do have these senators who are like, my God, I mean, this is so brazen. Like, we're at, we might actually have to do something about this. Like, you're making us all look bad as they're, they're sort of chastising uh, their, their colleagues in the Senate who are accepting all of Jugurtha's money. And that point, um, the, the corruption of the Senate by Jugurtha's money does become a flashpoint in Roman politics, where, again, if you go back to some of these populari energies that had been sort of started, had started fomenting, that they're saying, like, you know, Jugurtha is brazenly flouting uh, Roman authority and Roman law. We're, we're, we're telling him to do things and he's ignoring us. Uh, he's killing Italians. He's killing Roman citizens. And yet we continue to do nothing. Why is that? And it's because Jugurtha has bribed his way into the Senate. And so they actually open up, they're actually able to open up a sort of like a quasi, uh, like a special tribunal that is going to start to investigate and prosecute those in the Senate who were guilty of being corrupted by Jugurtha. Which gets me to a question of um, tipping points and, and points of no return. When you look at the you know, when, when people like to look for examples from the past to try to analyze our own times, and you do quite a bit of that in the book, and I love it. Um, but when you look at our situation now and the people who founded this country and who wrote the documents uh, that, that form our framework were keen students of the Roman Republic, obviously. And so they were paying attention to the flaws in their system and how things went wrong and tried to make uh, make changes in their own version, obviously, so that we wouldn't fall uh, down the same rat hole. Um, but when do you think it was irreversible? In other words, when do you think the death spiral had been reached where you can't imagine now uh, where, where the, 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 the points of no entry and the, the ability to compromise had just gone too far? I mean, is it when the violence first breaks out or is it after that or is it before that? Where do you, if you had to find a tipping point, when the iceberg struck the Titanic, maybe is a better way to put it, where is it in your mind? Well, so I'll answer that in a sec. I, I will say that, um, you know, one of the reasons we know so much about everything I just said about Jugurtha is because the Roman historian Sallust elected to write about the Jugurthine War and Jugurtha's corruption of the Senate and the battles that ensued. Uh, and Sallust was somebody who was writing, he, he was a partisan of Julius Caesar's. Uh, so he's writing his books right around the 40s and 30s BC. So he, he knows how it all turns out. And he's writing, you know, fairly fairly contemporaneously uh, with events. And he wrote about the Jugurthine War specifically because he said that was the tipping point, right? That was, the, and he said that was the first moment that, you know, like the old, uh, the, the corruption of the Senate was first challenged and what led to what became these partisan battles that ultimately destroyed the Senate. He he actually identified the Jugurthine War as, as, as that tipping point, which is why he wrote about it. Now, could the Senate ha or could 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 the Roman Republic have pulled out of it at that point? Like, I think so. the The point that I come to is it's it's really it's Sulla's conduct uh, at the very at what it, what becomes the end of the book. But Sulla's conduct um, during some of his final showdowns is really what sets the final permanent blueprint for how you can achieve power by completely disregarding just anything but brute force. So Sulla is going to, he, he loses a political confrontation. Sulla loses, he, he had command of this Eastern army. Um, he, Marius uses the power of the assembly to strip Sulla of his command and send Sulla away what Marius thinks he sent Sulla packing for good. And Sulla really is faced with this choice of, do I accept this defeat? Do I get stripped of my command? Do I accept the humiliation that I have just endured at the hands of my rival, Marius? Or do I go back to my five legions who are loyal to me personally? And do I point them at Rome and march on Rome to evict Marius from Rome and reclaim what I think is rightfully mine? Once, once Sulla did that, and then ultimately he emerges victorious from everything, um, that is the point that men like Julius Caesar and men like Pompey, uh, who's a, a, an early partisan of Sulla's, are going to be looking at later on down the road and saying, well, if, if nothing else, like I can do that. I mean, this is, 
we don't have any, I don't think, like exact quotes or proof in, in the in the in the historical record that Julius Caesar was was actively thinking about Sulla when he crossed the Rubicon. But it had to have been on his mind. And the proof was in the pudding for Sulla's conduct. If you get a large army, keep them loyal to you. You can use them to prosecute your own domestic political enemies and emerge victorious and become a dictator for life. So I, I sort of put it there. I think that Sulla's Sulla's decisions in those in those moments in the early days of the Civil Wars is really what what made it so that the Republic there was no I don't feel like there was any coming back from that. You had mentioned when Caius Gracchus was was looking at, at his broad range of reforms, you had talked about had they I'm going from memory here, but you'd said if they had been uh, enacted, it would have foreseen a lot of the changes that Augustus era Roman um, reforms had implemented and obviously a long time ahead of time. If, if something like that had gone forward, is that the example of a reform moment that had it come to pass, uh, uh, the inevitable death spiral that happened might have been avoided? I, th- I think so. Um, and it's because there, there would not have been quite the energy or the impetus to, um, to just crack the state in half, right? It, it, you get to a point where if, if your governing apparatus, like whatever it happens to be, if enough people start to feel like that governing apparatus is not working for them, it's not doing anything for me personally, why do I owe it as an institution any kind of loyalty? My loyalty ought to go to the thing or to the people, or in the Roman case, oftentimes to the general, who's going to be guaranteeing me the kind of security that I want in life, which is I want a plot of land, I want you know decent wages, I want, uh, I want some place to be able to settle and retire when I'm done here. By the time you get to the later Republic, that is providable by by warlords, uh, which is you know you could absolutely describe Caesar as a warlord. Um, once once it starts to become those guys who are delivering on the promises that that are being made, rather than the state itself. Yeah, there's what what is it that they had to be loyal to the Senate and people of Rome abstractly for? Um, so when you when you get to these moments when you can make some of these when you can have a little bit of foresight and say to yourself, well, is this model working for for the entire citizen population or is it just working for a tiny elite? You know, once you start ignoring the rest of the citizens and say, oh, it's working for a tiny elite, but that's fine; they'll just accept it. You do create a breach of legitimacy, and you do. Uh, alienate people to the point where they're no, no, they're no longer loyal to the system at all, and that's how you get people just crashing it over, and and most people practically not even caring. Yeah, the private military thing, which used to be illegal in Rome. Why did the Romans? Why why did the the citizenry or the Senate? put up with the change that, I mean, if you wanted to put the major thing that the founding fathers of the United States, of course, tried to do was to to make sure that the citizen uh, leadership controlled the military so that we had that separation. But but they kind of had that separation in Rome once upon a time. What made, and we'll make this the last question, but what made the 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 circumstances or, or public opinion or senatorial opinion, um, I was going to say change, but the word might be put up. Why, why did they put up with it? The raising of private armies. Yeah, the the reason why they put up with it uh, initially was because Rome was facing an emergency military situation, um, where they were sort of simultaneously ar- around the age of ar- around Marius, right? Because Marius is sort of the great, you know, it it had been moving in this direction of, um, well, just to back up in case people don't know this, uh, previously to serve in the legions, you had to own a certain amount of property. You actually had to literally be rich enough to serve in the legions. And by the middle of, of the book, by in the middle of the storm before the storm, you get Marius making this fateful request for an exemption from that requirement and just I, let me enroll any warm body who wants to show up and I'll train them and I'll teach them how to be soldiers. That was a, that was a fairly momentous change in, in how the Romans conducted politics and war and does have a lot to do with that those people who are now going to be loyal more to their general than to the state because it's the general who's going to be providing them and guaranteeing them uh, the the riches and land that they hope to get out of their service. So the reason why I think in that moment why the Senate says okay yeah you can you can draft anybody is that they had they had an ongoing war in North Africa. There was a huge slave rebellion that had consumed uh, that had consumed Sicily. 
and then the Kimbri, this this great Germanic you know, horde that it was it would just been sort of wandering around Europe for like fifteen years, would constantly come back around, and the north. So the northern border was very insecure. So I think it was it was a it was a matter of just like like in this emergency situation, we need to raise men and we need to raise a lot of men. So yeah, just go ahead and do it. And I think from that point on, they just sort of realized that um, uh, that this was this was a way to keep up with the manpower needs that their empire now had. They were no longer just this little city state that was occasionally skirmishing with the Samnites down around Capua. This is you know we have we have garrisons we need to be filling in Spain and North Africa and up in Gaul and as they as they move into Gaul um the Macedonian frontier over in Greece they're now they're now in charge of western Turkey um how how are we going to keep the legions filled i think once i think once they made the decision to go over to like let's just drop this property requirement in general i think it was fairly wildly successful in terms of their ability to raise the men needed to run their empire and then, you know, how does how does that move over to the, the real danger point, which is people raising personal armies? And I think a lot of this, like like a decent enough analogy, like not exactly, is like a political party going and looking for a candidate who can self-finance their campaign. Um, political parties at the state level, at the national level, always love a candidate who can walk in and say, oh, by the way, like the party doesn't need to give me any money. I'll just do, I'll just do this all out of my own pocket because I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a hedge fund manager. I am a, a, an owner of a business or like Michael Bloomberg is just like whatever it is that he's sitting on top of, right? Like he, like the democratic party didn't need to give him any money. He could just do it all himself. And the same was really true of, uh, of later of people like Pompey, uh, who could say, Hey, I'm going to go, I can go raise my own army. Like you don't even, you don't even have to worry about it. Like you elect me consul, I'll do all the work for you. Um, that's a, that's a very, that's a very immediately attractive proposition for most people. Um, especially out there, maybe you don't want to go to war, but you have a candidate who's like, don't worry, I'll, I'll get my guys myself and you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, that's where you start getting these personal legions being raised. And once those personal legions are being raised, again, now we're just, you know, the late Republic is just a clash of warlords. And that is really right now where you you look at it and you say, okay, I see some similarities, but there are some real big differences and we haven't gotten there yet, right? Sure. And I, I mean, honestly, like the, the military thing, you know, the, the United States has gone through a bit of a similar process after Vietnam where we said we're, we're no longer going to do this like temporary conscription into an army to go off and fight. And instead, we're going to make it all volunteer and, um, and all professional, right? I mean, that's a similarity, but there's so much about the institutional, what the, the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy institutionally is, um, does not resemble the personal warlord legions of the late Republic, right? Like, the paymaster is not your colonel. The paymaster is, is really, it's the United States of America. And we can, you know, our checks don't ever bounce when they go out there to some private or some sergeant or some major. So you don't have them being loyal specifically to just one, uh, just one commander out there. And then I've also heard, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune to be friends with uh, lots of veterans, uh, guys who are in the military now or who, uh, have left and are now veterans just to just back out in the civilian world with the rest of us that, I mean, there's enough that goes on with troop rotations, right? Where you're kind of bouncing between units. You're, you're never forming one of these like 20 year long bonds where you guys have all been serving together forever. Um, so I don't, I, I don't fear right now, like the role of the U S army, uh, in some kind of, uh, in some kind of warlord style clash. I, I don't see it happening anytime soon. One of the great firewalls that's actually working still, right? I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, is there anything, Mike, that I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure we know about the book or some of the story? Uh, I specifically focused on the things you know that I was interested in, but there's a heck of a lot in this piece. What else should the listeners know? Well, I think the, I think the one thing that we didn't touch on that is a that is a pretty major part of the book that has its similarities to the United States is this issue of the non the non-Roman Italians, um, where, oh, sure, sure. yeah, where just in case you don't know the backstory of this here, I'll do it real quick is that when Rome conquered Italy during the Samnite Wars, which is a couple hundred years before, you know, my book comes along, um, the Romans did not annex these people directly into the Roman state. They instead signed these, uh, these treaties with a city. So uh, a city in Etruria or a city in Umbria, 
would then become merely an ally of Rome. And when, whenever the Romans came around to ask for uh, legionaries for the armies, the city had to provide them. But other than that, uh, they were mostly left to their own devices. They could govern themselves. They weren't really taxed that heavily. But what happens is when you get to the period of my book a couple hundred years later, these guys had been inside of Roman civilization in every meaningful way for hundreds of years, and yet they were still, you couldn't even call them second-class citizens. They were not citizens at all. Uh, and they're facing the same problems, the same economic problems that their Roman cousins are, except they don't even have the right to vote in an assembly. They don't even have the right to send candidates for office and be like, well, hey, what about us? So they were, on top of everything else, they, they were facing economic, uh, economic problems and also didn't have any kind of political voice at all. And so that combines with the sort of the general uh, problems that are created by uh, the skyrocketing economic inequality that leads to a populare style confrontational style of politics that now defines uh, that now defines the republic. And that entire force of, uh, of again, like energy, I guess you could call it, um, the Italian question is what ultimately triggers the great civil wars of Marius and Sulla is the Italians constantly demanding citizenship, the Romans constantly saying, we're not going to give you citizenship. And what it finally takes is a massive, bloody and destructive civil war where the Italians are not trying to break away from Roman rule. They're trying to force their way into Roman rule. It, it was a it's going to be a war on behalf of political equality rather than a war uh, premised on political independence. So that's that's like the other big thing that's floating around out there. But other than that, you just you just read the book and uh, I'll explain it all to you. As one of my professors said, every educated person in the Western world should know the story that Mike Duncan catalogs in the storm before the storm, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. Mike, thank you for coming on the program. I wish you the greatest success. Thank you very much. Like I said, I think that this is the I think you could not have chosen a better subject. And I agree with you. It's shocking that this doesn't already have 20 books on the bookshelf about this, considering how awesome. And like, you, I mean, it, you know, it's hard to initiate enough disclaimers where you tell people, OK, there's so many different things. It's not really like us. But look at all these things that are like us, you know. Yeah, I, I figure if, if, if you're going to do it, because like one of the things that I always push against is that I don't think that we're anywhere near like the fall of Rome, uh, right. which is which is something that you hear from people like, oh, the Syrian refugees are just like the Vandals. No. And like, ah, not, not really. <laughs> so, no, wait till we start killing each other over political things. Then we're starting to move a little bit in that well, direction. Well, I mean, yeah, like if, if we actually have like a mass migrating population that has like an entire, imper uh, an entire armed force that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with the U.S. Army, then I guess, yeah, we can start talking about it, but I don't think we're anywhere near that. I and think I you're 300 think dead near. senators with Tiberius Gracchus. I think that's the moment where the, the sea change would happen. Yeah, I, I think I think that that period of the Gracchus is, is enough that I'm, I'm happy to now insert this idea into people's heads and say, no, like, this is the period we need to be paying attention yes, to. Yes, it's very important. Exactly. It's shit. not just for interesting. Per it's imp like, That's what my professor was pointing out, that if you're an American in this system, this is a story that our founding fathers thought was worth knowing, probably for an informed citizenry of a, of a modern commercial imperial republic might be a good idea to, to buy Mike Duncan's book. So that's the way I'm going to phrase it. Uh, if awesome. Dude, if I can do anything for you, I'm here. Okay, great. I really appreciate it. That was fun. My thanks to Mike Duncan. It was great to finally digitally interact with him. Go out and pick up The Storm Before the Storm. We will uh, link to it on our website. If you pick it up through Amazon, why don't you do so through our search window at um, dancarlin.com, and that will help us out too. Sure, the older hardcore history shows can be a bit traumatic, with titles like Death Throes of the Republic, Judgment at Nineveh, and addicted to bondage. We just consider that to be truth in advertising. No pain, no gain is our motto. Pick up the entire catalog from dancarlin.com.